Hi, hello, and welcome back to Program Analysis. This is still the lecture on slicing, and uh, we are now in video number four, where we will look at dynamic slicing, so a technique to produce a slice of a program um, based on an execution of this program. So as for static slicing, there is, of course, more than one way how you can do dynamic slicing. Um, the one that we focus on here is based on a paper from 1990, um, which defines dynamic slicing as the problem of finding those statements um, that are uh, triggered during an execution that must be executed in order to give a variable a particular value. So um, that means we um, look at a particular execution, which means we look at um, an execution driven by one particular value. And of course, it also means that the slice for this value may be different from the slice that you would get if you executed the program with a different value. Um, so every execution um, with different values may also give different slices. Um, why is this useful? Well, it's useful, for example, for debugging, where um, you may want to um, get a reduced program that still leads to the unexpected value that you're observing. So you have an input, you know that it triggers some behavior that you did not expect. And now you want to know which statements in this program are really um, relevant for this unexpected value. And in order to do this, you would essentially want to compute the dynamic slice. We will here look at two different approaches to do this. Um, um, they are very similar, but they differ in um, one important um, aspect, which we'll see. And we start with the simpler of the two, uh, which I just call the simple approach. Um, what you're given for both of them is um, a so-called execution history, which is basically the sequence of statements or the sequence of nodes in a program dependency graph that are executed with a given input. And now in order to compute the slice for a particular slicing criterion, specifically for a statement n, and some variable v is um, um, basically two steps. First, you keep only those parts of the program dependency graph that is also in the execution history. So only those nodes that are in the history um, are kept. And then the second step is basically the same as for the static slicing approaches that we've seen earlier, where we reduce the problem again to graph reachability. And in this reduced program dependency graph, um, starting from the statement n and the variable v, um, compute the slice by looking at which nodes can reach our statement n. As an example, to illustrate this idea of um, dynamic slicing, we'll use the following. So here um, have some variable x that gets a value depending on some um, input that is read, for example, from a user. So this is the part that determines which um, behavior we'll see and which we statically do not really um, know ahead of time. And then we have a couple of conditions that check, for example, whether x is smaller than zero or maybe larger than zero or maybe equal to zero. And uh, depending on which of these um, um, uh, conditions is true, different values are assigned to other variables y and z. And then eventually these two variables y and z are written to the console. So let's compute the dynamic slice for this example. And of course, because it's dynamic slicing, we need to um, look at a particular input and at a particular execution that is triggered by this input. So for the example, um, let's at first assume that our input is minus one. And then using this input, the question is, what is the execution history? So which of the many statements that we have here in this um, piece of code are actually executed? So if the input is minus one, then of course um, the first statement, so one is executed, then we will have this check at line two. This check will be true because x is actually smaller than zero. And that means that also three and four are executed afterwards. But then five, six, seven, eight, and nine are all not executed because we have already taken the if branch, but eventually 11 and 10 will also be executed. So now to compute the dynamic slice based on this execution history, we need to compute the program dependency graph again. And this is exactly the same as for the static slicing approaches that we've already seen. So this is also a nice exercise if you wanna just see how this program dependency graph will look like. I'll quickly do this um, also now for you here. So in the graph, we have nodes for each of the um, 
edges, uh, sorry, we have nodes for each of the statements in the program. So this and this and also 11. And then we have edges for the two kinds of relationships that matter to us here. One is um, the data dependencies. Oops. which um, I'll denote with this and the control flow dependencies with that color. So let's have a look at these dependencies um, and let's start with the data dependencies. So at line one, we are defining X, which is then used uh, almost everywhere else. Um, for example, at two and at three and also at four and also at five and also at six and seven and eight and nine. And that's it for um, for X. Then we have this definition of y at line three, which will be used at 10. So we have a dependency from three to 10. And similarly, the definition of z at line four will be used or could at least be used at uh, statement 11. And then for the other definitions at six and seven, um, it's more or less the same. So what is written at six may be used at 10 and what is written at seven may be used at 11. And then for eight and nine, uh, very similarly. So what is used, uh, what is written at eight may be used at 10. And what is written at nine may be used at 11. So these are all the data dependencies. Now let's have a look at the control flow dependencies. So basically um, here the question is which statement or conditional determines whether another one is executed. Um, so the check at line uh, or at statement two determines whether three and four and five are executed. So we have control flow dependencies to express that. And then the check at line five will determine whether six and seven or eight and nine are executed, which means we have data dependencies for this and also like that. And these are all the data, uh, sorry, control for dependencies that we have here. And this means this is also the um, entire uh, program dependency graph. Now, given this, uh, execution history and the statically computed program dependency graph. Um, the uh, yeah, um, idea to compute a slice is to first mark all the nodes that are actually executed um, in the history among the nodes in this graph. And this means we will mark node one and node two and node three, also node four, and then nodes 10 and 11. So this just means that these nodes are executed. And then the second step is to compute um, the slice we're interested in. So let's say um, we are interested in the slice of um, statement 10 and variable y. So basically telling us why this variable has the value that is going to be printed at this statement then what we are going to do now is we start at um, statement 10 and then follow the data dependency and control flow dependency edges backwards in order to figure out which other statements should be included. So going backward from 10, so of course we need to include 10 itself. Um, going backward, we will find three and then further going backward from three, we will also include two and one. But we, for example, do not include four and 11, even though they have been um, um, executed 
in this history. So the slice that we would get here consists of 1, 2, 3 and 10. So to show some of the limitations of this simple approach and also to double check if you've understood these ideas that I've explained so far, I have a second example which I'll invite you to actually do by yourself. So this is a little quiz for you. And then afterwards I'll show you um, the solution. So in this second example we again read some value um, from, um, from the input and store it in n. And then we have these three variables z, y and i that are modified down here in this uh, loop. And then eventually at statement nine, we are printing the value of z. And now the question is, if this last statement and the variable z is our slicing criterion, and if read input returns the value one, then what will be the dynamic slice computed by the approach that um, I've explained so far? So I'll invite you to stop the video here and just try it out by yourselves. And um, then next I'll show the solution. So let's have a look at how to compute the dynamic slice using the simple approach explained so far. So I had said that the input we are considering here is one. So this is what is returned by read input. And as a result, um, we can figure out which statements are actually executed. And this will be the following. So we first execute statement one, then two, then three, then four. The first time we reach this, conditional of the loop, um, one is smaller or equal than one. So we evaluate this to true. And that means we will execute six, seven, and eight. Um, now we've updated i to now be two. And now we're checking whether i equal two is smaller or equal to n, which is one. So this evaluates to false. So um, we do execute five, but then do not go into six, seven, and eight again but instead go to statement nine. And this is also the end of this execution history. So now to compute the dynamic slice, we again need the program dependency graph and I'll just speed this up a little bit. So we have these uh, nodes, one for each statement. Next, we have this set of um, data dependency edges, which I'm not explaining in detail because this is a quiz that you should um, do yourself. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to ask them in Ilias. And then finally, we have these three control dependency edges, um, which basically tell us that six, seven, and eight are executed depending on a decision made at statement five. So next, using the approach um, that I've explained so far, we again determine which of these nodes um, are actually in the history, in the execution history. So which of these statements are executed. And it turns out that um, these are basically all the statements, one, two, three, four, then five. Then because we've gone into the loop once, there's six, seven, and eight. And then eventually there's also statement nine. And now the second step is to compute the slice and we said we're interested in the slice starting at statement nine where we want to focus on this variable z. So we basically start here and then follow all edges backwards which means we also need to include this one and also this one and because we have six we also need five and also three. Oh, now I'm realizing I'm actually missing a data dependency edge, namely from seven to six, uh, which needs to be here because the value y that is computed in one iteration of the loop here may be used in a different iteration of the loop there. So this was missing on the previous, um, yeah, previously. But because of this edge, we now um, also need to include this statement seven and because um, we already have five. We also need to include four because four can reach five. And for the same reason, we also include one. And we also include eight also because eight is a node that can reach node five. And now what you see here is that basically the slice contains all statements of this program. 
And um, well, this is what we get based on the simple approach that I've explained so far, but this is actually not the best possible slice we could get here. So for example, if you look at this execution history, then the statement seven, which computes a new value for Y is not really relevant for the value that Z will have at the end, simply because after having computed this value Y, we never use this value Y again, because we just don't go again into the loop. But the way we've defined this uh, dynamic slicing approach so far, it will include um, statement seven and also statement eight, even though they are actually not really required to compute the right value of Z at statement nine. So more generally, what are the limitations of the simple approach that I've explained so far? So the, the basic problem here is that multiple occurrences of a single statement um, are represented as a single node in the program dependency graph. But at runtime, of course, this single statement may be executed multiple times and different occurrences of the statement may actually have different dependencies. But because we map all of this into a single node in the static program dependency graph, these different occurrences of a statements all get conflated into um, a single node. And as a result, the slides, slices that we um, get maybe larger than necessary, as we've just seen um, with the example. So now to address this limitation, let's have a look at the revised version of this dynamic slicing technique that we've seen so far, which is not the simple version anymore, but um, a better one that addresses this problem of having too many um, occurrences of a statement conflated into a single node. So in this revised approach, we are computing um, the slice based on a dynamic dependency graph, which is different from the static dependency graph in the sense that the nodes here now represent occurrences of nodes that you would have in the static dependency graph. And the edges do not represent the static um, data and control for dependencies as we've seen so far, but they represent the dynamic data and control for dependencies that we've actually seen in a particular execution. And now given this dynamic dependency graph, we com can compute the slice again in a very similar way to what we've seen so far by again, basically reducing it to the problem of graph reachability. So if you want to compute a slice for some statement n and some set of variables v that are used or defined um, at n, then what we do now is we compute all the nodes that are in um, this set as dun that can reach any of the nodes that represent occurrences of our statement n. And then the actual slice uh, consists of all the statements that have at least one node in this set as dun. And as we'll see, this is a um, smaller set, uh, or this can be a smaller set than what we get with the simple dynamic slicing approach. So here's our example again. And what we'll now do is to compute this dynamic dependency graph, where we have one node for every occurrence of an executed statement. So given the history that you see here, uh, which is the same as before, we would then have nodes for um, statements one and two and three and four. Then we have a node for the first occurrence and I'm putting this little uh, one here to denote this first occurrence of our statement five, which is then followed by an execution of six, an execution of seven and an execution of eight. And then we'll have a second occurrence of statement five here, and eventually this um, one execution of statement nine. Now, given this set of nodes, we can um, very similarly to what we've done for the static um, program dependency graph, now compute um, the, the dynamic variant of it by again looking at um, data and control um, dependencies. So let's start with the data dependencies here. So the value um, n that is um, defined here is um, used in the first execution of statement five and then also in the second execution of statement five because n um, just remains the same all the time. Next, let's have a look at the um, definition of z here at statement two. So this one will be used down here at statement six, so we'll have an edge like this. Then we can have a look at this definition of y at statement three, which will be used here and also here. So we have 
edges from three to six and from three to seven. Then um, this definition of I here at line four will be used here. So we have one from four to the first occurrence of statement five. And this definition of I is also used here. So we have another edge from four to eight. Then let's remain at this statement eight, which is also assigning again to this variable I, which is then used in the second um, occurrence of our statement five. So we basically have an edge from here to here. And then finally, um, the value Z that is used down here comes from this definition at line six. So we have another edge here from six to nine. Now these are all the data dependency edges. Let's now also have a look at the control flow dependency edges. And those are very similar to what we've seen in the static graph, just that now we do this for the right occurrence of um, node of statement five. And this is the first occurrence, which determines that six is executed and that seven is executed and that eight is executed. And um, that should be it, unless I've forgotten anything. These should be um, all the data dependency edges and control flow dependency edges in this dynamic variant of the program dependency graph. And now given this graph, we can compute um, a slice again, which we'll now do by basically um, starting at the node we're interested in, which is node nine and this variable Z. So we start at the corresponding node and then go backwards in the graph that we now have. So we will also include six. We will include five, one. So this first occurrence of statement one. And then because of all the data dependency edges, we also include one, two, three, and four. Now what you see is that we do not include seven and not eight and also not the second occurrence of five. And now based on um, these nodes that are included in um, our slice, we can um, map this back to statements by basically including all statements that occur at least once um, among the um, uh, marked, the, yeah, the, the nodes that I've marked with red, which means that we will include this one, we will include that one, we will include this one and this one and this one and this one and also this one. Um, but we do not include those statements here, right? So they are not part of this slice. And that's the big difference to um, the slice that we have seen before with the simple approach, because now we know that um, this right to Y and this right to I at line eight um, are not relevant for computing the value of Z that we'll see at line nine, at least not in this particular execution. So as you've seen, this um, revised approach of the dynamic slicing technique gives um, a smaller slice, which is probably better if you wanna understand the behavior of the program triggered by one particular input where one particular um, sequence of statements is executed. One interesting property of this um, variant of the approach is that it may actually produce a program that if you execute it with another input, does not give the same value as if you would um, execute this original program with the same input. But this is um, okay because this is not the promise that this dynamic slicing technique is doing. And instead what it's doing is it tries to give you a small um, set of statements that is relevant for um, a particular value that you get somewhere. And this is really helpful if you want to isolate these statements. Um, for example, if you're in the process of debugging or understanding why at a particular point in the program, if you execute a program, you're getting uh, a particular value. Um, just let me finish this by saying that there are many, many other slicing approaches. There is a very nice survey from um, Frank Tipp that reviews many of them. Um, and what we've seen here in this lecture is, of course, just um, a small subset of all the possible ways how people have defined slicing. 
All right, so this is the end of uh, video number four, which um, also terminates this lecture on slicing. So you've now um, hopefully learned what slicing is. You've seen two different static approaches to compute slicing, and you've seen uh, this dynamic slicing approach with its two variants here in this video, and hopefully have an idea now how to compute a small subset of a program that is relevant for getting a particular value at a particular program location. Thank you very much for listening, and see you next time.